If you really enjoy playing a rogue in D&D, but you kind of wish that you could get a little more damage to go along with all of that fantastic flavor and utility, then I think you're going to want to watch this video. Welcome to D4. Hey everybody, so here at D4, each week we take a deep dive into one, sometimes more, specific character builds for our favorite role-playing games. We crunch numbers about them, we theorycraft about them, not so that I can tell you the right way or the best way to play a particular character, but to explore one potential way to build something in the hopes of creating a character that is both really fun, but also really powerful to play. So if you enjoy creating characters for your favorite role-playing games almost as much as you enjoy playing the actual game itself, or if you're just looking for tips or ideas on how to build something that you're thinking about playing, then welcome home. This is where you belong and I'm really glad you're here, so thanks for watching. My name is Colby, not Cody, not Colton. <laughs> Really quick, if you would be interested in getting a written step-by-step -step cheat sheet to this build and every other build that I do on this channel so that you could recreate the character without having to go back and rewatch the video or take notes, then I would appreciate it if you'd consider joining as a member. There's a little button down there. For a couple of bucks a month, you get access to the library of write-ups that I create for each one of these builds. It's a great way to support the channel as well, so huge thank you and shout out to all of my channel members. You guys are amazing, and for everybody else, you're amazing amazing too. Thanks for just being here watching, liking, subscribing, commenting, clicking on the notifications bell. Those are also great ways to support the channel. And I'm grateful to you for just doing any and all of them. So thanks. All right. I am really excited today to get back to a Dungeon Dudes inspired 5e build. It's actually been over a month since I've created one, though only a couple of weeks since I posted the last one, but Baldur's Gate 3 has kind of taken over my life and the life of the channel lately, as you probably know. For those who are new here and don't know, Kelly and Monty, the Dungeon Dudes, are basically the coolest dudes in the universe for all things D&D, and you should absolutely subscribe to their channel and watch all of their videos. Over the last few months, they've been doing this series where they rank all of the multi-class options for each class. I take inspiration from a particular combo that they talk about and do a build on it. This week, we finally get to do the rogue. So excited. Now, here's the thing about rogues. I've said this kind of thing a lot on this channel in past videos, but the base class rogue is just not all that strong. In that rogue video, Monty even uh, said this. The rogue is actually in 5th edition D&D. It's not a very strong class. It actually is a pretty weak class. And so rogue wizard is better than straight up rogue, but worse than straight up wizard. And that's the issue. And I totally agree with him. I mean, I argued a couple of weeks ago that Paladin was the hardest class in the game to multi-class out of, right? In that Knight of Knaves video. I think the rogue might be the hardest class in the game to not multi-class out of, to just stay in. Of course. That all depends on the way you want to play your character. It depends on what kind of table you're playing at. For skill heavy, role play heavy, stealthy, sneaky, trap and hidden doors heavy campaigns, that's not necessarily going to be true. If you care a lot more about your utility than you do your damage, that's not going to be true. And also, of course, as long time or heck, even short time viewers of my channel know, I don't do a lot of utility focused builds on this channel. Not because I don't like them or because I don't think they're important for the game or that they're any fun or anything like that. Mostly because I have no way of knowing how important utility is to you, nor how much your DM is going to require stealth checks, lockpicking checks, or finding hidden door checks. But what I do know for certain is that for 99.9% .9 of you, you're going to have combat in your D&D game, and probably a lot of it. And also, it's a lot harder to put your skill prowess into a spreadsheet and graph it, right? <laughs> now, that hasn't stopped me from building characters who have amazing utility in the past, the uh, skill monkey, of course, being probably the best of those. But I mean, the Fey Wanderer comes to mind as well as a whole host of others. But yeah, in the end, for the reasons I've explained, my tendency is to look to dealing damage or maybe mitigating damage or healing damage when I build characters. And here's my hot, I don't know, maybe not so hot take. Generally speaking, and with few exceptions, the best rogues usually only take 
one, maybe three levels in Rogue, and that's it. With one to three levels of Rogue, you're going to get some sneak attack, a lot of skills and proficiencies, expertise, and those things are all going to give you most of what you need to effectively fulfill the role in your party of scouting, stealthing, picking locks, and disarming traps. Beyond that, if you want to be more effective in combat, at least, you're going to want extra attack, third level spells, or maybe both. And that means at least five levels in another class. Because here's the thing, I complain a lot on this channel about classes that don't scale well, right? And how because of the way that classes are front loaded and their damage doesn't scale well, it's usually better from a damage perspective at least to multi-class. You could absolutely argue, and I'm sure some of you might be doing so in the comments right now, that rogues scale better than any other class in the game, right? And in a way, that's true. No class just gets a consistent extra d6 of damage every two levels. In that light, sneak attack is amazing, and you should never multi-class out of rogues so you can keep that sneak attack damage scaling. But the sad reality is this. Because things like Sharpshooter and Great Weapon Master exist, because things like Spirit Shroud or Rage or Hexblade's Curse that add damage to every attack you make exist, because magic weapons exist in D&D that can do lots of damage per attack, heck, because we get to add our ability score modifier in damage to every attack we make, getting more attacks in a turn just outpaces adding more damage to one attack per turn like sneak attack does. And rogues don't get extra attack. So again, you're pretty much always going to be better off in combat as a rogue taking at least five levels in another class. And I don't want to do that this week because yes, as again, I'm sure some of you are screaming at the screen right now, there is value to taking more rogue levels beyond just more sneak attack damage. Uncanny dodge is cool. Evasion is awesome. Reliant talent is fantastic. More rounds of expertise, so great. Some subclass features are really nice. And damn it all, Colby, it's not just about the numbers. <laughs> oh, and I get it, I do. So today, here's what I'm going to try to do. Create a character who takes no more than four levels in anything that isn't rogue, so that it truly just feels like a dip, and make them as viable as I possibly can in combat. That means I'm intentionally not going to get extra attack or third level spells, and just see how competitive we can be damage-wise with other damage-focused builds, so that we can still hold on to most of our best roguish utility as we progress. Oh, and if you're interested in adapting this character for Baldur's Gate 3, stay tuned and in the final thoughts I'll talk for a minute or two on how I might adjust this build for that game. Alright, I'll get off my soapbox. I proudly present D&D episode number 145, the mostly rogue rogue, Inigo Montoya, the Spaniard. Nah, too nebulous and might offend some Spaniards. <laughs> how about just the Rogiest Rogue. Huge thanks to my good friend Randall Hampton for the fantastic artwork that he created for this character concept. He does this for my D&D builds every time I make one. He's a fantastic artist. If you'd be interested in following him on social media, or potentially reaching out to him to see if you can commission him to create some art for your character or even your entire party, I'll put links in the video description as always. But before we get into the build, I am super excited to tell you guys about World Anvil, who has been so kind as to again sponsor the video this week. I use World Anvil and I am a huge fan of what they do and I'm confident that if you are not already a huge fan yourself, you would become one if you would just give them a try. For those who don't know about World Anvil, they are basically the best software out there for DMs to build their homebrew world and for players to interact seamlessly with that world. For you world builders, World Anvil supports over 45 gaming systems, including D&D and Pathfinder, as well as many more. It will even facilitate letting you create your own system to work with their software. They make it super easy to create wiki style presentations of your world and your writing so that you can keep track of everything you build. They also have a fantastic interactive map builder that you can customize and even chronicles that combine timelines with those maps so that you can plot and keep track of what happened where and when in your world, whether before your campaign started or while your campaign is going. Presenting information to your players with World Anvil is so easy. And yes, speaking of players, World Anvil is for you too. It will not only make it easier than ever to access everything that your GM wants you to know about their world and their campaign, but you can even build your own character right from within World Anvil's site, regardless of the setting that your game is taking place in. 
It lets you keep track of hit points, spell slots, inventory, and it even has a user-friendly system for backstory creation, as well as journal entries and even note-taking for each session. Now, here's some interesting info that might be news to you. It was actually news to me. World Anvil right now is extremely close to launching version, wait for it, 1.0. That's right, despite being available for years, they haven't even yet released what they consider to be their first complete and full version. That blows me away. I mean, if this is beta mode, sheesh. But World Anvil subscribers are actually currently testing version 0.9, and that's the thing that's so great about these guys. They communicate so closely with their users. Subscribers are constantly testing and giving feedback, and World Anvil listens to that feedback and makes changes based on that feedback so that they're delivering with their end product exactly what their users want, and I love that. So please do yourself a favor and go check them out. You won't regret it. Sign up for a free account, if nothing else, to see what you might be missing. When you do, I'd appreciate it if you used this URL right here so that they know I sent you. I'll put a link in the video description as well, of course. And if you decide to purchase a yearly subscription, regardless of the level that you purchase at, if you use the code D4 at checkout, you will save a whopping 40%. Yes, 40. Go become a grandmaster at that kind of discount. All right, huge thanks to World Anvil. You guys are the best. Let's jump into the build. At level one, we are going to start off as a fighter. <laughs> just kidding, I'm just kidding. If we're claiming to build a character who's mostly a rogue, we better start with freaking rogue levels, right? So that's what we're doing here. Though, admittedly, we will be taking fighter levels later. And yes, it probably goes without saying, but I do anticipate this character being really, really good at all the things that rogues are good at. Picking locks, scouting, stealthing, disarming traps, and being a general skill monkey. So yes, starting rogue is really nice for that because it gives us four skill proficiencies when we start as a rogue, and that's more than any other class. Character concept-wise, I really like starting as a rogue because I sort of envision this character as, like I said, an Inigo Montoya from The Princess Bride, right? This was actually, I think, Monty's idea from the video. But yes, we are a bit of a scoundrel at the moment, maybe down on our luck, looking to right a great wrong that was done to us long ago. But we're destitute, without a lot of resources with which to exact our revenge. We're starting out scrappy, trying to claw our way towards vengeance with whatever resources we can beg, borrow, or steal. As for our race, I'm kind of of two minds here. On the one hand, we could go custom lineage and start with an 18 dexterity or variant human, and either route would get us a free feat, and I actually really want at least one feat here for sure, and could use more, of course, but also, we're going to be super mad on this build, multiple ability score dependent, right? And so I really need more than just two little ability score bumps. Also, we are going to be attacking with dexterity on this character, and we'll often have advantage, at least during our burst or nova round, and Yes, I'm building this character for Nova damage, which is where I think rogues can potentially both shine numbers-wise, but also conceptually. I really like to make my rogues burst damage dealers. I'm not really here to just stand in the fight and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with you for 10 rounds, yeah? I'm here to put a blade in your kidney when you least expect it and then flit away into the shadows so that you can't retaliate. Well, because you're dead. So maybe so that your friends can't retaliate, I guess. Anyways, yes, using dex to attack with advantage, you know what that means. We want elven accuracy, so we've got to be an elf or a half-elf. And yeah, I'll take half-elf here for the better ability score increases. As for which half-elf subrace, pick your favorite. If I only have like a mediocre charisma score or worse, like we're going to here, then I tend to favor wood elf, half-elf, personally, for the increased move speed, but you do what you want to do here. As for our starting ability scores, I assume that we're going with the point by method as always and say, let's go 15 dexterity plus two from our racial there. 13 constitution plus one there, a 13 strength, a 13 charisma, and an 11 wisdom plus one so that we can at least get it up to 12. Like I said, we are pretty mad. And though I am happy to at least get dex to 16, con to 14, and, and wisdom to 12, I'd love a higher wisdom score, not just for the important wisdom saving throws, but also because we use our wisdom score based perception to find traps and hidden doors and things. We'll be hoping to make that at least a little decent though, so no worries. As for starting equipment, I'm gonna suggest the gold buy route as I often do and say let's grab some studded leather and a rapier. Right, we are not going to be using two weapon fighting on this character. You could, using your bonus action to make like an offhand attack if you're dual wielding short swords, for example, right? And sure, that will give us a little more damage 
plus another chance to potentially trigger sneak attack if we miss on our first attack, right? But without the two weapon fighting style, the damage from that offhand attack is really small. And we'll actually have a way to both add more damage to our attack if we don't take the attack action, which is necessary to do for two weapon fighting, right? And also, our first attack is going to have a really high hit rate anyway. And I really like keeping my bonus action free on my rogues for cunning action or steady aim. So we'll stick with a single rape here throughout our career, I think. As a rogue one, then we get thieves can't. Yes, they can. So dumb, but I must say it every time. Uh, yeah, this is the special coded language that thieves get to be able to decipher messages that they write to one another. But then we get expertise. This lets us double our proficiency bonus for either two skills that we're proficient in or one skill and the proficiency bonus that we get when we use our thieves tools. I think I would go here for perception, first of all. With our 12 wisdom, we need all the help we can get on spotting things that are hidden, and that's kind of a big part of the rogue's job when they're out there scouting and stealthing ahead, right? Secondly, I'd take either our proficiency bonus with thieves tools or stealth. I wish I could get both, but you're gonna have to choose. Do you wanna be harder to see or more reliably be able to pick locks and disarm traps? I'd probably say the latter, but it's gonna depend on your table, your campaign, and your character concept. Rogues also get sneak attack at this level, which tells us that when we make an attack with either a finesse or ranged weapon against an enemy who we either have advantage on or is standing next to one of our allies, we can add an extra d6 of damage that scales with level once per turn. And that wording is super important because, as many of you know, that means that, yes, we can do that damage on our turn, but if we're making an attack against an enemy on their turn with our reaction, for example, then we can apply sneak attack damage then as well, so long as we otherwise qualify for sneak attack. And that's going to be really important for us if we want to stay competitive damage-wise with other builds. At level two, we get cunning action. This lets us dash, disengage, or hide as a bonus action instead of an action. And that's actually really important and powerful. I probably undervalue this when I do builds and underappreciate how often we might be using it in game to get to our next target or hit and run or keep to the shadows. Super useful. At level three, we get our roguish archetype, our subclass, and we are going to go with arcane trickster on this build. I have a lot of reasons for wanting to go this route with this character and I still think it's probably overall the most powerful rogue subclass because, well, spells. So yeah, we get to learn cantrips and first level wizard spells as an arcane trickster, but two of those first level spells have to be from the enchantment or illusion schools, and the other one can be from any school we want. As for the spells we should take, I'm going to say for cantrips, grab message because it's great for utility, especially if you're scouting or stealthing ahead of your party, and then either booming blade or green flame blade. In case you need a reminder, both of these cantrips will let you make a weapon attack as part of casting the spell, and then after level 5 at least, add extra damage to the attack itself. In addition, with Booming Blade, the enemy takes more damage if they move. With Green Flame Blade, you can do some extra damage to an enemy standing nearby. We are going to be using one of these all the time on this build. As for first level spells, for the non-enchantment or illusion spell, I would grab Find Familiar. This is going to let you have a handy little pet who can not only do some great scouting for you, but can also, in D&D at least, as opposed to BG3, take the help action on their turn, granting you advantage on your first attack. An advantage is of course important for any attacking character in this game, but none more so than rogues, since that can trigger our sneak attack if our enemy isn't standing next to one of our allies, right? If you're new to this tactic, I always advise taking the owl as you're familiar, since they can swoop in, take Take that help action and then fly away without provoking an opportunity attack, thus helping to keep them safe. Arcane Tricksters also get the Mage Hand Ledger Domain feature, which gives them the Mage Hand cantrip but lets it be like super, super mage, mage Hand mage. because it's invisible and can use your thieves tools to like pick locks and disarm traps from a distance, right? Among other things. Incredibly useful. I often forget to mention the steady aim feature that rogues get at level three that comes to us from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, right? This tells us that if we haven't moved this turn and are okay reducing our move speed to zero until next turn, we can get advantage on our first attack this turn by using our bonus action. I think this is a lot better on ranged weapon users, but you might wanna use it if your familiar is dead and you don't have a way to trigger sneak attack otherwise. Speaking of sneak attack, don't forget that at this level, it does scale 
scale up to 2d6 now. At level four, we get our first ability score increase or feat, and of course we are going to take Elven Accuracy. This bumps our dexterity by one, rounding it up to a nice even 18, and then tells us that if we are an elf or a half elf, and are making attacks with dexterity, or charisma, or wisdom, or intelligence for that matter, and we have advantage on that attack, then we get to roll three d20s instead of two, basically. And that really does wonderful things for our numbers, and is my favorite feat in the game for that reason. But at level five, now that we've got our first ability score increase, that elven accuracy secured, our subclass, and some sneak attack dice under our belt, I think it's time for our first dip into another class to really increase our burst damage potential. And yeah, that's gonna mean fighter levels. So at this point in our character's career, they've maybe managed to pull themselves out of the slums, maybe with help from some newfound friends, of course, and have decided that if they really want to kill that six-fingered man, they're going to need to get better at fighting, maybe specifically at the art of fencing. So we're diving into our martial prowess with fighter levels, and that means as a fighter one, we get second wind. This lets us heal for a d10 plus our fighter levels as a bonus action once per short rest. And then we get our fighting style. And even though I do want dueling to get more damage on our rapier attacks, we get a lot more mileage, at least on our burst damage round, from superior technique. This lets us learn one maneuver from the Battlemaster maneuver list and gives us a single superiority die per short rest to spend on that maneuver. That die is only a d6, but we want, yes, trip attack. Because trip attack would potentially let us knock our enemy prone, and if we're attacking a prone enemy from within 5 feet, then we have advantage on our attacks. Meaning that on our turn, we could get advantage on our first attack, thanks to our familiar, and then advantage on the rest of our attacks this round until they stand up. Making it a lot easier to both hit them and also trigger our sneak attack. Wait a second. You may be thinking, we are not too up in fighting and we don't have extra attack. Why does this matter so much? Give me a second. Uh, don't forget also that since we are proficient with shields now as a fighter, there's no reason why we couldn't equip one to give ourselves a plus two to our armor class. We're not regularly casting spells that require a free hand and we're not two weapon fighting, so more survivability is always welcome. Also importantly, Booming Blade and Green Flame Blade go up at this level to do an extra D8 of damage to that initial attack against the enemy um, and up to two D8 if they move for Booming Blade or an extra D8 on the ally standing next to your target if you're using green flame blade. But the main reason we wanted to go fighter, of course, is because at level 6 we would be a fighter 2 and that means we get the almighty action surge. So that once per short rest we can take two actions instead of one. Now, this is good on every single character, really. But it might be better on rogues than any other class, arguably. The reason? Simple because sneak attack can trigger once on a turn, like we've said. And in D&D, not in Baldur's Gate 3, unfortunately, one of the things you can do with your action is to take the ready action. When you do this, you simply hold your action until a trigger that you decide on takes place. When that trigger occurs, you can use your reaction to do the thing you said you were getting ready to do. So, for example, you might say, I want to ready my action to cast the booming blade spell on this enemy as soon as it's their turn. Or if that's like too cheesy or metagamey for you or your DM, then as soon as they move even a hair's breadth or whatever. And this then is going to lead us to our level six damage report, which is perfect timing because we need to talk about what our tactics look like at this level. On our Nova round, we would simply approach our target and cast Booming Blade on them, making a rapier attack that will do 2d8 damage, one for the rapier, one for Booming Blade, calling on our friendly familiar to help us so that we have elven accuracies like triple advantage, right? 3d20 is giving us an incredibly high likelihood of hitting. Assuming we hit, we would apply both 2d6 in sneak attack damage plus 1d6 and our trip attack maneuver to the enemy. Assuming that they're large or smaller and that they fail their saving throw, they're knocked prone. We would then action surge, but instead of hitting them again, we would just ready that action to cast Booming Blade on the enemy again at the beginning of their turn. As soon as that trigger happens, we hit them with another Booming Blade, and since it's being done on their turn, not ours, yes, we get to add Sneak Attack again, plus the extra damage from Booming Blade, though not from our superiority die, of course, we spent that. Anyway, 
All told, if both attacks land, we will be hitting for a total of 4d8 plus 5d6 plus 8 damage. And thus, against an enemy with a 10 armor class, we would on average do 49 damage here during our Nova round, and against an enemy with a 15 AC, it would be just a teeny bit less, 47. And compared to other burst damage builds I've done to date, that's good, not great. Call it like middle of tier 3 compared to other Nova builds at this level. So yeah, it's hard for rogues to keep up, even when they're getting sneak attack twice per round, right? Don't worry though, we're going to do some things to make it a lot better. And we're going to be scaling quite nicely. And hey, we're still mostly a rogue here, meaning we have all of that skillish utility that we came to the class for in the first place, right? Right. Alright, at level 7, I mean... We are a melee combatant looking to do burst damage, and we already have some spell slots. We gotta take a pally dip, right? <laughs> of course, you don't have to. You could stick with Rogue. You could do a little more fighter for a subclass. Battlemaster looks nice for more superiority dice, more maneuvers, Eldritch Knight to double down on spells, or, I mean, heck, even Champion wouldn't be a bad thing. Maybe a little boring, but I mean, Elven Accuracy critting on a 19 or 20 means a 27% chance to crit. And remember, sneak attack dice get doubled on a crit too. Plus Booming Blade, it's not bad. But Pally will give us more guaranteed on-demand burst damage. And when I'm building a burst damage focused character, I'll always take burst damage you can plan on over, surprise, burst damage, you know? But yeah, character concept wise for me, this is the time in our hero's journey where they swear their oath, vowing to exact revenge on the one who has killed their father. Or wronged them or those they love in some other way. Even though we're not technically going to be getting a paladin oath or subclass on this character, maybe you're making a vow of vengeance now as a budding paladin, yeah? Anyway, as a paladin one, we get the wonderful Lay on Hands ability, which gives us five Lay on Hands points per paladin level to either heal with an action and a touch, one hit point per point spent, or we could spend all five to cure a disease or poison. Super useful in a pinch. And then we also get the much less useful Divine Sense, which lets us detect undead fiends or celestials that aren't behind total cover. Maybe it'll come in handy once in a while? Maybe not. At level 8, we would be a Paladin 2, and that means we get all kinds of goodies. First up, another fighting style, meaning that we can grab that dueling fighting style after all to give us another 2 damage per attack with our rapier, so long as we don't decide to put another weapon in our offhand. We also get Paladin spells here, but since Charisma is our spellcasting stat as a Paladin and we only have a 13 Charisma, I'd stick with stuff that just works, so cure wounds for some nice on-demand healing when our Lay on Hands points are spent, and bless for one of the best buffs in game, adding a d4 to the attacks and saves of you and potentially all your allies, depending on your party size or how high you can upcast the spell. But you know what else we could cast as a first level pally spell that requires our concentration? I mean, why not Thunderous Smite? Hear me out. I know that the 2d6 damage it can do to an enemy is less than the 2d8 we'd get by spending that spell slot on Divine Smite, which we'll get to in a second, but we aren't necessarily using our bonus action for anything at the moment, and while sure, we could and arguably should be concentrating on Bless for our entire party, I mean, there's a pretty good chance that someone else is doing that already, no? We're level 8. Okay, so in all seriousness, if no one else is using Bless in your party, then you should totally do that. It will do wonders for your entire team. But you guys know me. I like to throw caution to the wind and explore what's possible, damage-wise, even if it might seem ill-advised. And hey, Sometimes the difference between a dangerous enemy surviving one more round to wreak havoc on your party and dying right here, right now, will be the 2d6 damage that Thunderous Smite can bring. So let's pretend we're in that situation and thus using the spell, okay? For science! Okay, so yes, we often forget about Paladin Smite spells since we generally just use Divine Smite instead, right? At least until 1D&D goes live. But as a reminder, with Thunderous Smite, you cast it as a bonus action, it requires concentration, and then the next time you hit with a melee weapon attack, hopefully later this turn, you smack them for an extra 2d6 thunder damage and they are both pushed 10 feet away from you and knocked 
The nice thing about that is there's no size restriction here. Trip attack only works against large or smaller creatures. If you're fighting something huge or gargantuan even, now you've got a chance at knocking them prone too. And regardless, if you apply trip attack still, they're gonna have to succeed on both saving throws to stay on their feet. This is actually seriously worth considering using, depending on the fight, and I love it for our Nova round. Right, I haven't even talked about Divine Smite yet, which is the main reason we went Paladin in the first place. So with Divine Smite, you hit with a melee weapon, you spend a spell slot to do 2d8 extra radiant damage to the attack, plus another 1d8 for every spell level you upcast it beyond first. Unfortunately, we only have first level spell slots at the moment. Even with our multi-classing into half and one-third casters, as an arcane trickster, right? Like we've done. But we do have three of them to spend at this level, which is exactly how many we could potentially blow during our Nova round if we wanted to. But at level nine, yeah, we have reached our limit on the non-rogue levels that we can take as per the rules that I set up for myself at the beginning. So back to rogue we go. As a rogue five, that means uncanny dodge, a wonderful ability that lets us use our reaction to have the damage on a single attack made against us. Of course, we're using our reaction during our Nova round anyway, but outside of that, we don't have a way to reliably attack with our reaction every turn, so this will get plenty of use to help us stay alive. Don't forget, sneak attack scales now to 3d6 when we use it. Just in time for our level nine damage report. All right, things have changed for us quite a bit since last check. Now, on our turn, we're still making a familiar assisted booming blade trip attack with our first action, but before that, we will be using our bonus action to cast Thunderous Smite. And then if we hit, we'll be spending a spell slot for Divine Smite to boot. Then action surge again, ready the action. And then when we attack with our reaction, we're gonna be adding another 2d8 smite, potentially. Our sneak attack has increased by a d6 as well. And we've added two to each of our attacks thanks to the dueling fighting style. And thus, at this level, against an enemy with a 10 armor class, we would on average do 89 damage during that Nova round, and against a 16 AC, it would be 86. Okay, that's more like it, almost double since last check. Compared to other Nova builds I've done to date at this level, we're more like middle of tier two. Climbing the charts, baby. And still filled with a boatload of utility, really strong defense, and even some nice support options to boot. Best mostly rogue ever. At level 10, we would be a rogue six, and that means we get another round of expertise. And I think I'd be taking either stealth or thieves tools here, whichever we didn't take last time, and then maybe sleight of hand. Unlike in Baldur's Gate, I don't find sleight of hand checks coming up all that often for me at my D&D table anyways, though it does feel like an important roguish skill to have. If you don't think that you'll get too much use out of sleight of hand, maybe consider investigation here. At some tables, I know that you have to like make an investigation check to like figure out how to disarm a trap once you've discovered it, for example. And it's generally a pretty useful skill to have. Importantly, keep in mind, thanks to multiclassing, we do now get second level spell slots for bigger and better smites. At level 11, we would be a rogue seven, and that means we get evasion. This is a favorite of rogues and monks the world over. It tells us that if we have to make a deck save to take half damage on something, say a fireball, for example, well, with evasion, we take no damage if we succeed on the save and only half damage if we fail. Very nice. Keep in mind, sneak attack scales up to 4d6 at this level, and we do get access to second level illusion and enchantment spells here. The ones I would prioritize would be invisibility, just in case we need to be extra stealthy, and mirror image for some fun, you're seeing four of me right now, defensive shenanigans that could help keep you safe. And no, since some of you might be wondering, we will be passing on Shadowblade this time. Sad panda. If you can cast Booming Blade with Shadow Blade at your table, then go for it. But the reality is that we'd actually do less damage making a regular attack with Shadow Blade here than we would using Booming Blade. And rules as written, there's a prohibition against using Shadow Blade to Booming Blade. Not to mention, Shadow Blade requires concentration, so we'd have to give up Thunderous Smite, and it takes a bonus action and a second level spell slot to summon it. One day, I might do an Arcane Trickster who focuses on Shadow Blade. But yeah, the spell slot progression is so slow, it makes it tough. But yeah, I mean, at this level, level 11, right, Booming Blade gets another D8 bump on both the initial hit and on the damage they take if they move. So again, that's gonna be more than the 2d8 damage that you'd get from a Shadow Blade attack. And besides, 
We're level 11. Surely we've got a great magic weapon by now, right? Anyway, at level 12, we would be a rogue 8, and that means we get another ability score, increase our feat, and even though we could do more to increase our burst damage by taking a feat I have in mind here, I just don't think I could sleep at night with this character if I didn't cap my dexterity first. What? I thought you were always beholden to the spreadsheet. I know, I know, but if we're really trying to be the best rogue we could be, I mean, dex increases everything we do. Our important skills, our armor class, our damage, plus our saving throw and our initiative is a no-brainer, even for me. Also, at Arcane Trickster level 8, we can swap out a second spell from enchantment or illusion to a spell of a different school, right? And you know what? There are actually a ton that I would consider here. I mean, shield, of course, for defensive purposes, but Misty Step is always handy. Maybe slightly less so for those of us who can dash with a bonus action, but still. Vortex Warp is great for moving people around the battlefield. Spider Climb if you need to get up a wall. Even Cloud of Daggers is worth a look since the damage it does just happens without the enemy getting to make a saving throw against our crappy intelligence-based spell DC, right? At level 13, we would be a Rogue 9, and Arcane Tricksters get Magical Ambush at this level. And alas, we are not going to get much use out of it. <laughs> if I had a nickel for every time I said, one day I'm going to make an Arcane Trickster build that really takes advantage of Magical Ambush, I would have at least 25 cents, at least. But yeah, this feature tells us that if we cast a spell from hiding, enemies affected by the spell have disadvantage on their saving throw against it, which might be nice if we didn't have any intelligence and thus a really lousy spell DC. I mean, sure, with disadvantage, you still might get a wisdom or intelligence or charisma based save spell to stick to targets a little more reliably, even with our crappy intelligence, but I just don't think this is a feature to build around for this character anyway. Sorry. But hey, chin up. Sneak attack scales to 5d6, so it's still a great level for us. For our level 13 damage report, since last check, our Divine Smite has gone up to 3d8, our sneak attack has scaled to 5d6, our booming blade damage has gone up by a d8, we've capped our dexterity at 20, and we've picked up some nice defensive and utility stuff as well. And so, against an enemy with a 10 armor class, on our Nova round here, we'd do 128 damage on average, and against a 17 AC, it would be 125. Okay. Some decent scaling, but compared to other Nova builds I've done to date at this level, that's actually more like bottom of tier two, top of tier three. So still quite good, but yeah, slipping just a bit by comparison since last time. No worries, we are still the roguiest rogue compared to all those other pretenders. At level 14, we would be a rogue 10, and rogues very happily get a bonus ability score increase or feat at level 10, unique among all classes. And as much as I'd love to grab something sensible to help out with our defenses, I think the best thing we could do for our Nova damage would actually be to grab the metamagic adept feat. This lets us pick two metamagic options from the sorcerer's metamagic list and gives us two sorcery points per long rest. Man, I wish it were per short rest. So bad. To use on one of our spells, right? And while yes, I think subtle spell is a great option here, letting us actually get a spell with verbal and or somatic components off while hidden without revealing ourselves, the more important one for burst damage purposes is, yeah, Quicken Spell, letting us cast a spell that normally requires an action as a bonus action. This means that from here on out, once per long rest anyways, we could Quicken Booming Blade as a bonus action, right, and smite with it, then Booming Blade with our action, again smiting, and then Action Surge, ready action, Booming Blade smite with our reaction. Three smite-fueled Booming Blade attacks on our turn, in a round, two of them applying sneak attack. That is a glorious thing. At level 15, we would be a rogue 11, and we get that darling of skill monkeys everywhere reliable talent. This is so good. I wish I could have gotten here sooner, but I'm just happy we got here at all with as much damage as we're putting out. Reliable Talent says that when we make an ability check in a skill that we are proficient in, we treat anything rolled lower than a 10 as a 10. So yeah, at this point, the lowest we could get for a stealth or thieves tools check would be what, 25? And perception isn't much worse, it's like 21. That's so awesome. Don't forget, sneak attack scales again here to 6d6. At level 16, we would be a rogue 12, and that means we get another ability score increase or feat, and I think 
that I would probably go Warcaster here. Resilient Constitution would actually do a better job of protecting our concentration, but Warcaster helps by giving us advantage on those concentration checks, and also lets us cast a spell as an opportunity attack if we get one, meaning we could Booming Blade them as they move away from us, right? Plus Sneak Attack, plus Booming Blade damage that they get for moving. That makes for a heck of an opportunity attack if one comes up for us, probably outside of our Nova round. And by the way, if your DM is one of those who says that the enemy stops moving upon getting hit with a booming blade opportunity attack so that they don't take that extra thunder damage, then they need to go to timeout. Happily, also, we do get third level spell slots from multiclassing Paladin with Arcane Trickster Rogue at this level for bigger smites. But then finally, for us, at level 17, we would be a Rogue 13, and that means we get Versatile Trickster as an Arcane Trickster. And you know what? I'm pretty sure that as often as I've used Arcane Trickster in builds, it might be my most used rogue subclass. I've never gotten to this feature, as I always end my builds at level 17, and I'm pretty much always taking at least five levels in other classes on my rogue builds, if not more. So yay, because it's a nice feature. It says that we can use our bonus action to cause our mage hand, which remember is invisible, to give us advantage on attacks against an enemy until the end of our turn. Alas, it's not until the end of the round, but still. It's kind of like they're doing super help, so if our familiar is no longer with us and or we can't get the enemy prone or whatever, this will be a nice way to ensure advantage, probably outside of our Nova round when we're using that bonus action for Quicken Spell. Anyways, we do get third level illusion or enchantment spells here as well, and my favorite would actually be Catnap, I think. This lets us, once per day, basically give our party a short rest in just 10 minutes instead of the usual hour it takes otherwise. BG three players are like, what? A lot of the resources that we're using for burst damage, action surge, our superiority die, come back on a short rest. So this will be handy for both recovering hit points and for our damage capabilities. Aside from that, fear and hypnotic pattern are of course the standout spells in these schools at third level, but alas, we have a crappy intelligence. And no way to respec. Oof, that feels harsh. <laughs> BG three has spoiled me. Eh, we'll be fine. Also, just FYI, next level we could swap out another spell from Enchantment or Illusion, right, to grab a different third level spell here, and I'm 100% taking haste. This would let us get an extra attack on our turn, which sure is nice during our Nova round, but the real value is for sustained damage. You use your hasted action to make a weapon attack and get sneak attack damage, but use your regular action to ready your action and then hit with your reaction, right? And with haste up, you can do this every single round, not just when you have action surge available. We actually built around this in the Quickened Blade a while back, which was a sorcerer rogue, and was pretty awesome, I think. Anyway, sneak attack scales here to 76. I think that might be the highest I've ever gotten sneak attack damage in a build before. And when you get it twice in a round, it's a lot of damage. Finally, don't forget, Booming Blade gets its final scaling here too, to 3d8 on a hit, 4d8 if they move. For our final damage report then, since last check, we've seen scaling on Booming Blade, scaling on our Divine Smites, scaling on our Sneak Attack, and above all, we're dropping Thunderous Smite for a third Booming Blade and Smite-fueled bonus action attack during our Nova round via Quicken Spell. This actually means that you could, and maybe should, be using Bless for concentration now. Again, someone else might have it, and we'd need to spend around casting it instead of going Nova right at the beginning of combat. But let's assume that we've got it on ourselves at this point. Yes, for fun. Don't forget too, we've had some big bumps to our utility, support, and survivability along the way as well. But against an enemy with a 10 armor class here, we would do 199 damage on average during our Nova round. Oh, I wanted to get to 200 so bad. And against an enemy with an 18 AC, it would be barely less, 196. I love you, Elven Accuracy. And yeah, that's a big bump since last time. I mean, when everything goes up and you get another attack, that's bound to happen, right? Compared to other Nova builds I have done to date at this level, this puts us back pretty solidly in like the middle of tier two for Nova damage. And yeah, with as much utility as we have, that's a good place to be. All right. Let's dig into some final thoughts. The tier score for this character, if you take 
the damage that they do during their Nova round against every armor class that we calculated for at all four of the damage reports, just average it into one big number, we end up with a 107. And that puts us right at the bottom of tier two, as I kind of expected, just below the Storm Sorcerer Tempest Cleric. Do I have any cards left? I don't know. I guess we'll find out. Admittedly, if we would have gone Metamagic Adept before capping Dexterity, it would have raised our numbers a little higher, a little earlier in time for that level 13 damage report, would have raised our average, would have been better for our Nova damage, but worse for like everything else. So I'm not sorry. All right. I have a bunch of thoughts on this build, actually. It was a fun experiment. Trying to make the rogue's numbers viable without taking five levels in another class was a challenge, but I think we got there. At least for a Nova damage focused character, right? But I am left feeling just a tad dissatisfied, I think. I mean, it's like, oh, two levels of fighter and two levels of paladin are really good for burst damage on a melee character? Who knew? Of course, the way we're using that action surge feels a lot different on this build than others. And getting to the numbers we got to without extra attack felt pretty unique. But I think finding the exception kind of proved the rule. If you want your rogue's damage to keep up with other damage focused builds, you pretty much have to find a way to get sneak attack with your reaction. I feel like I've explored just about every way to try and do that with different builds on this channel to date, on a single character especially, but even on team up, like two build videos like the wolf and the coyote or the battery and the blender or the mountain blade. And while finding those interesting and creative ways to do stuff on a character is fun, sometimes I can't help but feel like I shouldn't have to twist myself into knots to keep up here. Also, it's a lot easier to do this for burst damage than it would be for a sustained damage build. Without extra attack or the haste spell, I don't even know if I could. Though, I guess I'll keep the idea on my to-do list. The question I always have to ask with these Dungeon Dudes inspired builds, of course, is, is this build better than a straight class rogue would be? And I mean, this one's easy, right? Like Monty said in their video, yeah, pretty much every multi-class with rogue is better than a straight rogue, in my opinion, and at least when we're talking about damage. And this one is no exception. But I do think it is better damage-wise than most rogue builds that you could come up with, especially if you're limiting yourself to four levels in other classes or less, right? Of course, like we've said, at the end of the day, yes, there's more to the game than just big damage, I know. And being able to bring almost all of what makes rogues fun and useful and versatile in-game, along with big Nova numbers, feels really cool. And I'm really glad that we got there. And I certainly hope that you find them someday. You are ready then? Whether I am or not, you've been more than fair. You seem a decent fellow. I hate to kill you. You seem a decent fellow. I hate to die. <laughs> Finally, yes, as promised, how would I adjust this build for Baldur's Gate 3? I mean, in BG3, there's no such thing as ready action, right? So those two levels of fighter are a lot less impactful. I'd probably cut them entirely. We also don't have Booming Blade in the game currently, so we'd just be making weapon attacks. Of course, you could go Battlemaster to kind of sort of imitate what you're getting from Booming Blade and still tripping and giving yourself advantage. But yeah, I think instead I would focus more on Paladin. You could take Oath of Vengeance at Paladin 3 to both keep in line with our character concept, but also guarantee you advantage on at least one enemy per short rest. And we're a Nova damage character, so that's not a bad thing. Familiars don't work quite the same way in BG3. The superior technique fighting style isn't a thing, so Vow of Enmity is a nice way to ensure advantage for us, right? And it's a lot easier to take short rests in BG3 than 5e generally, so you're probably going to have Vow of Enmity for every fight. I might go Thief Rogue instead of Arcane Trick losing those spells and spell slots for stronger smites would be a bit of a bummer, but two bonus actions each round with Thief in BG3 is really strong, especially when you need a bonus action for Vow of Enmity, right? In that scenario though, I'm dual wielding instead of using a rapier so that I can make smite infused bonus action attacks with my offhand. So yeah, a dual wielding Thief Rogue with probably four levels of Paladin to get Oath of Vengeance advantage and three spell slots to smite with, plus the feet from Pally 4 are the major changes I'd make, I think. Or alternatively, two levels of Paladin for smite and two levels of your favorite full spellcaster so that you can have second level spell slots for more and bigger smites. Anyway. 
that's the video for the week. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I love you guys. You're the best. Thank you so much for all that you do for me, for the channel. I hope you have a really great day and a fantastic week. And if you don't, hang in there. I hope that you stay safe and that you be kind and that I see you again really soon. But until then, take care. Blackbird singing in the dead of night Take these broken wings and learn to fly All your life You were only waiting for this moment to arise Blackbird fly Blackbird fly into the light of the dark black night. Oh, what is your favorite Beatles song? I'm uh, introducing my kids to them right now. And, hmm, so many good ones to choose from. Blackbird's got to be near the top of the list, I think, for me, though. Carpe. Carpe diem. Seize the day, boy. Make your lives extraordinary. <laughs> Name that movie. Here's a hint. I named my firstborn child after one of the characters in it. Don't even say that. I thought, do we learn one or maybe it's two? Hmm. Just one. Okay. Don't fall. Don't fall, Maple Waffle. No. We could quick and booming blade during our Nova round. Smite. Smite. <clears throat> Do <laughs> Tell me more. Ooh, anybody else feeling sleep deprived from too many late nights playing BG3? If only my kids didn't have to be out the door at 7.45 in the morning for school, I, I wouldn't be quite so tired. Worth it.